Denley, lovely to see you. How are you? Very, very well, thank you. Not too bad. Well, I say very well. I'm, I'm pretty bored, I'm not going to lie. Um, it, gets, yeah. it gets you down eventually, doesn't it? It does a little bit, yeah. It's, um, days are very repetitive. Um, finding different ways of trying to entertain the kids. Um, missing, missing the cricket, obviously, is a massive part. Uh, missing that competitive edge that us sportsmen love and we're all used to. So, um, so yeah, it's been tricky, but um, hopefully a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel now and uh, we can get back out there soon. What are you, what are you hearing? What, I mean, I've, I've read all kinds of you know, lockdowns and rules. and what, what, what are you hearing? What's the latest for you? Uh, potentially um, start training um, on the 1st of June. Uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, probably at Canterbury with probably Matt Walker. Um, so literally just be a case of turning up, getting out the car, having a hit, jumping in my car and leaving. Um, there's going to be pretty strict protocols in terms of um, what those training sessions will look like. Um, and then hopefully uh, around the 20th, 22nd of June, uh, potentially get together as an England squad um, and prepare for the test matches against the West Indies on the 8th. Um, none of that's been signed off yet, but they're pretty confident that the, the government will sign all that off in terms of the safety and everything. Um, so, fingers crossed that happens, and um, yeah, I'll be back back at it in the next few weeks. I, I mentioned earlier your wizard Zoom calls. Have, have you been doing, I guess, with Kent, I guess, with England? What have they, what have they had you doing? All kinds of fitness routines. Have you been able to go and run and all that kind of thing? Yeah, so I've, we've been sent um, our programs from, well, I'm contracted with England, so they send me through a, a fitness program to do with whilst in lockdown. And I know Kent have been really busy as well with their fitness. Um, we've actually got a new fitness trainer on board this year. So you know, he's been great and um, setting up the boys with, with various different training programs. And we've got a competition running at the moment as well. It's all different groups of five um so there's like a point system uh, over a two <laughs> two week period so that just gives a bit of competitiveness to it um so yeah we've all got our programs to follow which has been good um you know getting outdoors and doing the making the most of that hour to, to, to exercise and doing your running um and turned a little i suppose makeshift gym in my kitchen um which uh, <laughs> does a job uh, so, hey, some good news this morning. Um, uh, Captain Tom Moore's going to be knighted. Fantastic, isn't it? Um, you know, what a hero. Unsung hero. There's, there are, there's lots of them around, isn't there, that, that, that go unnoticed. But what he's done, certainly over this period, um, to raise all that money um, is, is absolutely sensational. So fully deserved by Captain Tom. Couldn't be happier. And he's a Kemp fan as well, so even better. Well, he, tweet, he, tweeted, he tweeted you, didn't he? He did. He did, yeah. Um, well, I just sent him a, a birthday message um, and he replied. I'd love to get a message back from him. Um, and hopefully once um, we get back playing, uh, we've invited him and his, his grandson down to, to, to Kent to come and watch a, a game, hopefully. And oh, fantastic. Get to meet him. So that'd be great, yeah. To be fair, you've been quite active on Twitter. I mean, I feel like when I'm doing these interviews, I feel like a stalker. You know, you go through your Wikipedias and Google everything, Joe Denley, looking at your Twitter. You, you pinned Henry as well, didn't you? I saw that on the BBC website. Tell people who might not have seen that. I did, yeah. We, um, so, yeah, when the, the start of the season was supposed to happen, we're obviously all in lockdown. Um, so, yeah, as cricketers, we all put on uh, little videos of, or scenarios, should I say, that, that may have happened um, had the season kicked off. And um, I got Henry to chuck me down a nice little underarm half volley that, that Graham Onions may have chucked down at me at Lancs. We were due to play Lancashire first game of the season, uh, just, in the <laughs> just in the corridor at home. And, um, and then sort of I let Henry have a bat, put, it, put my helmet on him and he was loving it. And so I thought I wouldn't send him down a little juicy half folly. I'd let him have it tough and, uh, yeah, managed to get one <laughs> in him straight in the grill, which uh, he didn't enjoy very much. But it was only a softball, so it was all right. Um, we've been doing a series that's called the Old Footballers Club. Um, so I'm going to rope you in, get you through under the wire, because you, you played football, didn't you, for Charlton? 
I did a long, long time ago. Yeah, it was um, schoolboy stuff. Uh, under sort of under fourteens, fifteens. Uh, yeah, loved my football growing up. And what were you? What did you play? And who? Come on, to, who? Who today in the Premier League would you compare yourself to? What were you? What were you like? <laughs> See, when I was growing up, I was more of a midfielder out on the right wing. Um, decent right peg on me. Um, quite fit up and down, up and down the, uh, the touchline. But nowadays, certainly in cricket warm-ups, I'm more of a striker. I like hang, goal hang and um, goal. Yeah. score the goals up front. But oh, to compare myself with someone in the Premier League, oh, that's a tough one. I don't know. Bit of a Jamie Vardy, little poacher up front. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, the, the, I missed the football days actually. I gave up playing football competitively when I was about home. So my dad said, Look, you need to make a decision here because it's either cricket or football. And I chose cricket, which uh, I think was probably the right decision. <laughs> um, <laughs> Very much so, yeah. And uh, yeah, never really played a competitive game since. You know, only in, only in, in warm ups at, at cricket. Uh, do I get to kick a ball around? But um, yeah, love it. Um, you broke into the Kent team very early on. Um, were you ready for it? And how how tough was that? Um, yeah, I I think I was ready for it. Yeah, I I say that like I, I was desperate, obviously, to play. It was a, a boyhood dream, sort of growing up through the Kent age groups, and um, I suppose being touted as uh, as a as a bright prospect in the future. Um, I suppose to get that opportunity uh, at a young age was was really exciting. But I think certainly in my first year, I, I soon found out that I needed to improve. Um, you know, I was playing against proper bowlers um, week in, week out. I was getting hit in the helmet, hitting the gloves. Uh, I didn't think I, well, I wasn't aware that I had a problem with playing the short ball. But um, as soon as you uh, step into the the professional arena there's um bowlers that test you out in that area and that was made aware that i needed to work on that and um i went away that winter and and worked on that and and came back a lot better player and um yeah had some reasonably good years early on who were your mentors who, who looked after you in the early days so yeah my first sort of proper coach would have been uh, simon willis who was um yeah. no simon yeah yeah, running the academy, running the um, the age group stuff, and Chris Stone as well was an early one for me who I played a lot of second team cricket with as coach. Um, um, but yeah, so I think Simon Willis, Paul Farbrace was around as well, um, sort of on the academy and um, linked with the the ECB age groups as well. So um, yeah, those three probably when I first started as a young kid growing up, they they were quite big influences on my on my batting and and um and coaching um you know i'm still in contact with um simon willis a bit and obviously farby um you know if ever i've got a problem i'll uh, contact one of them um because you know they've watched me grow up they know my game inside out and um i suppose it's always nice to have someone to call that that might spot something that, that you, you haven't spotted yourself so um yeah it's always great to, to to hook up with the uh, old coaches. Um, and I know Rob Key's been ill. We wish him all the best uh, lately. What kind of influence was he? Did he look after you, Rob? Yeah, he certainly did. I think when I made that transition from second team and age group cricket into the, the first team squad, um, you know, I was opening the batting with Keezy, so um, it was important for us to strike up a you know a decent friendship. And to be fair, my first year in that in that team I didn't really say a great deal and, and Keezy um, Keezy didn't think I, he, he used to say he didn't think I had a tongue for the first first uh, <laughs> season that I played with him because I, I never used to really say much I was quite shy and sort of just got on with my business without trying to um, rile two of the old fellas up but um, <laughs> yeah great great friend of mine now and um, yeah he was great he, he certainly looked, looked after me I think as a youngster when you go into play first class cricket you come up against like I say some very good players or bowlers that will try and get in your head and um, I suppose intimidate you uh, when you're batting um, try and pick apart your technique and all that sort of stuff and having Keezy up the other end who always had my back sort of if, if a bowler was getting into me he'd you know he'd get stuck into the bowler and say yeah, 
and pick what are you picking on the youngster for say something to me like that kind of stuff do you know what i mean so it was always always nice batting with him knowing he had your back and um, being captain as well um you know still in regular contact with him now and yeah he's a, he's a great man so um like you say i've spoken to him recently and he seems to be doing um doing well um so right. hopefully helpful pick picks up and um yeah he'll be he's on the road to recovery that's for sure um you got into england uh, um and played uh for england oh gosh it's about 11 years ago i suppose looking back now then you went to middlesex and you, you had a dip in form describe describe for people who maybe don't understand what is it when you you lose touch is it about confidence is it about technique what what is it or is it a, a combination of of everything uh, yeah, for me, <clears throat> well, my sort of, th those those years at Middlesex, I was, you know, I was in a pretty bad place, actually, because like you say, I, I I played for England 10, 11 years ago, and if I'm honest, I, I wasn't ready for international cricket at that age. Um, you know, I don't think I had complete confidence or belief within my own game. I don't think I had played enough first-class cricket or list A cricket. Um, to build up the confidence of, of stepping into the international arena. Um, you know, everyone deals with that differently, but I think it was probably a little bit too early for me. Um, but in saying that, when I got dropped, all I wanted to do was, was get back in that England side as quickly as possible. Um, went back to Kent and had a, a reasonable, reasonable finish to the season, but... You know, I felt I needed a change um, and to help me get back into the England side, I thought I moved to Middlesex playing Division 1 cricket and um, a big club like Middlesex would help that. Um, but like I say, all my focus was on England cricket and getting back in and, and, and therefore I put a lot of pressure on myself um, to perform week in, week out. Uh, and for me, I think probably not so much a technical issue, it was more mental in terms of putting too much pressure on myself and forgetting um you know what what made me a good player really um and and the pressure got to me in the end and you know i i had an okay first year of middle sex but that wasn't enough i needed to improve and try changing my technique um which was probably one of the worst things i did i tried changing my grip almost forgot how to hold the, the bat. I could have pretty much turned the bat around and held the other end. It was, you know, I was in that bad a place. Um, and then found myself playing second team cricket for the next year and a half and didn't really know where my cricket was going. And yeah, I was in a, a pretty bad place confidence wise. And, um, you know, like I say, and I think that was on the back of putting so much pressure on myself to perform and get back in the England side. And, you know, thankfully, we spoke. Keezy uh, gave me a call and said, "Look, come back to Kent if you. We really want you to come back and just enjoy your cricket again." Um, and that's what I did, and it's probably one of the best moves I've ever done. And um, here we are today. The 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 second England coming. I, I mean, have you been able to actually enjoy it a lot more? Maybe it's maturity. Maybe it is your age. Where, where not so much you 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 don't take it as seriously but you're able to take the pressure off and go it's almost like a second chance isn't it really yeah and, and I think I'm a lot you know I, I touched on those those few years at Middlesex being you know pretty rough but I think they made me a better player um, I, I think I learned a lot from from those times in terms with um, not putting too much expectation on myself like I say when I moved back to Kent it was more about just trying to fall in love with cricket again and enjoy it um, you know not focusing too much on results and just working hard each day and um, yeah you know just trying to relax a bit more um, so yeah when that second chance come around for England I wasn't it wasn't in my plans to get back in England side like I say before that was what it was all about but um, it was just on the back of enjoying cricket and um, playing for Kent, scoring runs for them. And, and yeah, I suppose now that chance is here, I'm a lot more confident, a lot more belief within my own game. Um, that fear of failure is certainly not there like it used to be. Um, you know, I'm quite content um, and, and I've got a method and a routine that works for me. So um, yeah, it seems to be going pretty well. Seems to be going absolutely unbelievably. Um, and it, it, it is, 
it's fantastic. You've been involved in some amazing series, haven't you? You sort of crashed into some historic series like The Ashes, like South Africa just gone. They've not been boring at all, have they? No, they've been they've been great fun. It's um you know, it's been different as well. Sort of when I played all those years ago, um, completely different side now. You know, a real great bunch of lads. Um, not saying that there wasn't great lads back then, but I was just a bit young and um, yeah. But now it's honestly a, a, a team of genuine friends that enjoy each other's company. Um, and like you say, yeah, we've been in, you know, I've been involved in over the last sort of 12, 18 months and some cracking series. That Ashes series was fantastic. Obviously disappointing not to to get the Ashes back, but um, you know. Uh, a drawn series, which I think was a fair result. Um, some very competitive cricket, great battles uh, against a, a very, very, very good Australian team. Um, well, Australian bowling lineup and Steve Smith, should I say? Uh, <laughs> that, that win, the winter just gone. That South Africa series was absolutely brilliant as well. Um, some some cracking matches there, and again, two very even teams matched um you know that cape town test will sticks out for me uh, a fantastic five days fantastic five days of cricket down to the wire um and yeah the emotions after that game after all that hard graft there's nothing there's no better feeling of um a win whether it be in four day cricket in county championship you know uh, or five day test match um yeah fantastic result and when Matthew Wade's giving you all kinds of stick at short leg and the Aussie slip cordon are gunning for you, how, how do you respond? How do you keep you cool? Or do you give it a bit back? Yeah, no, I've never really been one to give it back. I think, um, yeah, he was a little quite, he was quite a chirpy little fella, actually, Matthew Wade. Uh, he had a lot to say. Um, but no, I generally just choose to ignore them. Um, that seems to, to get their back up a little bit more when you don't sort of bite back. Um, and yeah, obviously, typical Australians, they're always sort of chirping in your ear, aren't they? Just little reminders of a, how bad a player you are and how lucky you are to have a, an England cap. Um, but no, it was great fun. It was, you know, nothing too, too serious or uh, anything like that. So yeah, great, good banter uh, and good to be involved in. Are you superstitious? No, not really, although I always put my left pad on first. I just, you know, I knew you were going to say that. I put my left sock up my sleeve and then out of the back of my head, but I'm not superstitious at all. <laughs> no, I'm not too bad. That, that Headingley test match when Stokesy was playing, I'm not a very good watcher. Um, and I found myself doing laps of the sort of toilet area um, and I, I literally couldn't move. I literally, I didn't see any of that last hour of play. Um, there was a little monitor in the changing room that I'd keep peeking at, but no, I was, uh, there were, that was a little bit superstitious of me. No one sort of left their spots in the changing room, and we all sort of sat where we we had been for the you know, previous hour. Um, so yeah, that was probably the only superstitious part of, of my cricket. How significant has your bowling been? He's sort of MVP, I love that phrase, in 2018. And suddenly from nowhere, your leg spin, I don't know if it, if it, well, it must have helped. And also going forward, I guess, in T20 franchises and things like that, it would be a real bonus. Yeah, it's definitely helped, um, without doubt. Uh, it's, I think it played a, a, a definitely a factor in, in getting back involved with the, with the England side. Um, you know, having that extra dimension to my game, um, you know, it's great. I think, you know, Bilbo and Walks, I think I have to give a lot of credit to them for giving me the opportunity to uh, open the bowling specifically with uh, T20 cricket. Um, yeah. You know, being a wrist spinner, there's um, it, obviously it's great to have leg spinners and, and guys of, of that kind of variation within your team. And, um, yeah, that really opened, I think, a few doors for me in terms of being able to open the bowling in the power play uh, and obviously being a top order batter as well, I suppose, is, is quite attractive for, um, you know, the England side and, and these T20 franchises around the world. So I think that certainly helped my case in terms of getting these different gigs and 
um, I suppose, just taking my, my career up to the, the next level. I mean, we, we sit over Christmas and we, we glue to the big bash and I know you sort of had a, a, a bit of a truncated IPL, but what's it like to be involved in, in these series? It, look, it, it looks full on, first of all. It looks, it looks a good gig. It looks a good crack. Oh, without doubt. It's great fun. Great, great fun. The Big Bash is, um, you know, they do it really well. It's, it's great entertainment. Um, fantastic grounds you play out week in, week out. Um, and an amazing country. There's obviously quite a bit of downtime in between games that, you know, you get to go and see these amazing countries and, um, you know, travel the world. Very fortunate in that regard. Um, and you, you strike up good friendships, which is one of the most enjoyable things. You, you get to play with, obviously, all these different players from around the world and um, learn off them. Um, and like I say, strike up good friendships that, that last forever. And, you know, I've been able to do that. The IPL was a, a little bit different. Um, not the best experience from a personal point of view. I only oh. played one. I played one game, got a first ball up, didn't bowl, <laughs> and don't think I touched it in the field. So, thanks for coming, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, not not the best experience there, but an amazing um, to to experience the, what the IPL is like. It, cricket's like a religion out in India, as we know. And I uh, my home ground was Eden Gardens in Calcutta, which holds about 80,000, 90,000 people on every home game, it was full. Um, you couldn't hear yourself think. It was incredible, incredible atmosphere. Um, so to get the chance to experience that, and like I say, just take in different cultures and experience different parts of the world is yeah, very fortunate. Um, best bowler you faced? Oh, best bowler ever. Give us a few. Just a few, okay. Um, well, from my early days, I think Steve Harmison would have to be up there. I had some good battles with him. Um, the uh, very hostile, tall, gets a lot of bounce, obviously quick. Um, yeah, he was he was a challenge. I've uh, been lucky enough to face Shane Warne and Matai Marilithrin, um very early on in my career as well. And, I uh, had a bit of success, actually, against Warren. I, I scored my first Championship 100 against Hampshire, uh, and Warren was playing in that. Um, so that what did he do? A, just kick it away outside leg stomp? Or what, how did he play Warney? Well, it was, it was at Canterbury, so it wasn't a, you know, a real great turner. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he was, he's a genius. Uh, if in doubt, sweep is, uh, is the motto, isn't it, against spinners? Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't sweep a great deal against Warren, I have to say, but Murray Litherin pretty much swept most balls because I didn't really have a clue. I played forward to one deliver, I remember, at Old Trafford. Um, and I thought it was the other one, so it was played like that. And it's bounced up and hit me in the throat. Um, <laughs> it was obviously a bit of a turner at Old Trafford. So from then on in, I uh, yeah, got the broom out and started sweeping him. And <laughs> didn't get what about... What what about latter day, the Aussies, South Africa, the, the, the yeah. Test, the West Indies? Who have you got there? Yeah, so Pat Cummins, phenomenal. Um, well, you could probably go through that whole Australian bowling lineup, actually. I thought they were brilliant as a, as a unit. But Pat Cummins, Pat Cummins and Josh Hazelwood, I thought, as an opening pair, were as good as it gets or as good as I faced. You know, Cummins with his pace his skill of being able to bring the ball back in at you and, and challenge you with the short ball as well, which was on the money every single time. Um, and, and that was all day. He had an amazing engine on him and, and, and would run in um, all day long. Um, and then Hazelwood at the other end, great skill, just landed it almost like a your Glenn McGrath, I suppose. or Sort of your Lee McGrath combination is, is probably your, your Hazelwood and Cummings combination, very similar. You've got the pace yeah. and the um, so yeah, that was a, a great challenge. Uh, and then the, the South Africa series, again, the Nubal pairing of Philander and Rabada. Um, very similar, I suppose, combination to what we had in the Ashes. You've got the, the pace uh, of Rabada um, and skill, uh, and then just the, the complete accuracy of, of Vernon Philander. Brilliant. Um, Aaron Stevens-esque. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. 
defending it on the seam more often than not. And, if, you know, just getting any kind of movement out of the wicket, um, you know, he was a great exponent of that. So, yeah, those those four bowlers uh, of the, you know, nowadays, they, they'd be up there. Um, I, I think I've done quite well because we've got for about, what, 25 minutes there and I've not mentioned the catch. <laughs> I think I've done really well there. Which catch? <laughs> one in the, the ashes? The brilliant, one of, the brilliant one of Tim Payne I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, it's quite sad really. You used to be able to type my name in YouTube and all my batting would come up. Now it's, <laughs> you type, if you type my name in, it just comes up with the worst drop catch in test history. <laughs> I'm not going to end it there. So come on, give us the, uh, not not on a downer. Give us the future. You, what, what does the future hold? Uh, hopefully, more England and and then onwards as you, you I guess you you head upwards in. I hate talking about it in age. You'll you'll be doing franchise stuff with you or looking to do a bit of that. Yeah, I think one thing I've been good at in the last two or three years is is trying not to look too far ahead. And, yeah, uh, fair dues. Yeah, um, but I think certainly you know. The next sort of twelve months is to to play as long as I can for England, one hundred percent, without putting too much pressure on myself, like I have done in the past. But no, I'm loving it at the moment. I'm loving being involved with the squad and and, and the group of players. Um, it's exciting. There, there's a T20 World Cup. There's a, an Ashes series next year again, which I'd love to be a part of. Um, but yeah, I suppose now is just getting through this lockdown, uh, getting back with England and, and performing um, and trying to stay in the team as long as possible. Um, and when that finally does finish, um, like you say, I'm, I'm 34 now, so hopefully a couple more years of international cricket. But, you know, when that finishes, um, you know, finish my career at Kent, play as long as I can, um, to try and contribute to Kent being successful over the next few years and, and bringing trophies back to, to Canterbury. Um, with a little bit of uh, franchise cricket in there as well, absolutely. Um, yeah, that would be uh, that would be Plan A. Hey, you stick to Plan A. Oh, thanks a lot for your time. Take care, mate. Cheers, Rob. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>